Yes. I'll just, I'll just uh, formally start to welcome you everyone to the first Sustainable Global Economic Law Lecture of this academic year. Um, and we are really excited uh, that Vlad invited our speaker for today. So I am gonna let Vlad do the formal introductions, but just to say thank you so much for, for, for joining us. And we really do try, as many of you know here, to sort of um, have these spaces for really meaningful conversations about, about important work at the intersection on of global law and global economic law and social justice. So thank you so much for, for being here and glad. Great, thanks Ivana. I will be uh, very brief, uh, but I'm very excited to have Fazanti Venkatesh uh, with us today. Uh, Fazanti is Associate Professor of Law, Land and Local Economies at Windsor Law School, uh, which is in the Toronto area in Canada. Um, and she's also the director of the Migrant Farm Workers Legal Clinic. Fazanti is currently working on a book manuscript uh, on a topic related to the presentation that she will give today. Uh, she will say a little bit more about this work, but uh, I will just briefly there is okay. say about Fazanti's work and her publications. I will not go through them, but I will just say that uh, she has been one of the few people that have been thinking about migrant workers, uh, sort of uh, short-term migrant workers programs through this lens of uh, racialized capitalism for a long time now. And uh, I think that's particular interest for this group here and sort of uh, quite quite valuable uh, in comparison to other work that exists on migrant worker schemes. And uh, I'm very excited to hear about it now. And uh, the floor is yours. You will also say a little bit about your work, so which is why I'm limiting myself. But uh, just briefly to the format, you have for about minutes and then we have to help uh, of the seminar for discussions. Great. Um, thank you so much, Vlad. Uh, and thank you for the uh, Sustainable Global Economic Law Research Project for inviting me. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure being here uh, at the University of Amsterdam Law School, a gorgeous uh, building, a gorgeous city. Um, so thanks everyone for being here uh, and for being here to listen to what I have to say. My primary research areas, as Vlad said, is labor migration, comparative law and political economy, and law and social movements, so law and resistance. Um, I've studied temporary foreign worker programs, I think now for over 15 years. I, as part of my doctoral dis dissertation at University of California, Berkeley, I did field work on temporary foreign worker programs in Canada, Israel, where they have uh, Thai workers uh, working in agriculture in Hong Kong and the United States. Um, I run a migrant farm worker clinic, as Vlad said, at University of Windsor, which is a region where uh, a large percentage of the agricultural workers in Canada uh, come to work through their temporary foreign worker programs. It's the first migrant farm worker legal clinic of its kind in Canada. But the important part is that we run the clinic along with Justicia for Migrant Workers, uh, which is a grassroots organizing group, and the clinic functions as a law and organizing uh, as a law and organizing clinic. So uh, a lot of what I um, research on and what I present on comes from that experience of uh, working with and for uh, migrant farm workers. Um, so, um, um, so I present today a few areas of analysis from uh, my ongoing book manuscript that I've been working on now for a couple of years that looks at temporary foreign worker programs and the law uh, globally and historically. So, um, okay, so, um, so far, um, you know, a lot of this, especially since the COVID pandemic, the issue of temporary foreign workers is now familiar to, I would say, uh, to, I would say, a larger uh, population. But in general, of the group that I'm talking about, and even though um, in terms of migrant farm workers, you have, in migrant workers in general, you have people who work uh, uh, through undocumented statuses and other forms of statuses. The specific group that I'm talking about are workers who come through a, through uh, specialized programs. 
So in Canada, this would be the seasonal agricultural work program and the two-year ag stream, uh, where the SWAP program gets workers from the Caribbean and, and Mexico through bilateral agreements. In the United States, this would be the H-2A temporary agricultural workers program. In Israel, it would be the Israel-Thailand farm labor agreement. In Netherlands, uh, even though there's a complicated system, the closest would be the seasonal work visa in, in agriculture for, uh, for uh, workers from the EC countries. Uh, in Spain, you have the Spain-Morocco agreement and so on. And in fact, now these programs are so ubiquitous. There's such programs in the Global South as well, in Malaysia, in Mexico, where they're, they're also sending countries as well as receiving countries uh, for, for, for foreign workers. Um, in agriculture, it's, it's, which forms one of the uh, most important sectors in which these temporary foreign workers work, uh, it's also, as, uh, they also work in very specific sectors. And that, that forms a very important note for us when we think of, about the political economy. And these would be uh, even in highly, um, in countries where a, a lot of agriculture is mechanized, like in Netherlands, these would be labor intensive sectors such as horticulture, floriculture, vegetables, uh, which have, uh, which require uh, labor intensive work. And so, um, so it's almost tried to say how uh, these workers have become a structural element of the agri-food system globally. So the important part of these temporary foreign worker programs is that they are crafted as a solution to irregular migration. Uh, in that, it's to strategically create a special category of persons who have been given the right to work for a short period of time within the borders to alleviate labor shortage uh, in low wage, undesirable, economically necessary jobs, but with no right to remain. Uh, so this is unique in that undocumented workers, they remain in the country unless they're marked for deportation. But these workers, they have to leave at the end of their uh, contract. Um, so uh, so usually too, and as would be uh, familiar to many, many of the workers who come to these countries also come from spaces which are marked with historical legacies of colonization and racialization. And that includes actually Central and Eastern European uh, workers coming to work in Northern Europe. But especially so when you think about Caribbean and Mexican workers in the United States and, uh, and Canada, and also when you think about uh, the Spain-Morocco agreement uh, and so on. Some programs uh, are instituted through bilateral agreements with sending countries, such as the uh, Canadian agreement and the Israel agreement, but others are open, working through recruit, uh, recruitment agencies or in Canada through the, or in Europe through the posting uh, system that's there. And, uh, and there's a certain just-in-time aspect of these programs because they can respond to economic vicissitudes that the agriculture sector uh, is subject to, from climate issues to harvesting failures, uh, through, uh, through the idea of time-limited harvest uh, as well. So what you have then is that this just-in-time aspect of these programs puts tremendous power into the hands of farm owners, employers, recruited, recruiters, and numerous intermediaries. Um, in Canada, for example, 80% of the Mexican workers in the seasonal work program have to be explicitly named by employers to come back to work for the next season. In all these countries, uh, workers can be terminated and then as soon as they're terminated, they have, they're immediately repatriated. So this is different from deportation. They're immediately repatriated back to the country. So there's almost no due process, uh, which all automatically makes sure that any kind of legal mobilization or legal claim making uh, is thwarted. So the legal construction of these temporary foreign workers as being permanently temporary, that's, that's something that you hear a lot, is because they are now an essential part of the uh, of the agro economy and these short temporal periods allows for unequal rights to be justified by law and practice even in areas such as labor rights which are considered to be attached to personhood not citizens or citizenship but the temporal aspect or having limits the rights that uh, that's available to them uh, scholars who study racial capitalism such as Adrian Smith he conceptualizes this regulatory system through the dynamic of mobilize to immobilize. 
derived from the study of plantation labor uh, that I'll talk to in a bit. Uh, so what that means is that racialized and class oppressed workers, usually from global South countries, are mobilized under a narrative of supposedly consensual contractual freedom to engage in wage labor, but that deliberately immobilizes them to create unfree labor conditions. So these rights and access to citizenship are withheld as an active strategy through various direct and indirect means, for example, through creating time limited categories, such as seasonal per work permits to prevent the wor workers from ever settling in the host country. In fact, if the philosopher Michael Walzer uh, has commented that if they, if these workers are given the same freedoms and rights and power as other citizens, they would just compete with them for better jobs. Why would they do these jobs? So there is a paradox here that is created, right? That uh, that you need them, but you cannot give them full rights. So this managed migration, which is a language that you hear a lot, is thus is thus a critical handmaiden for this racial capitalist economy that we see, uh, where race, uh, where labor laws, which are race and migration agnostic, in the sense they're colorblind or migration blind laws, they end up being ineffectual and oftentimes may even suppress worker structural and associational power, as I show with respect to the construction of the employment contract. So foreign, these temporary foreign workers then accord what's called in this liminal space between commodity and illegality, because that's a space that they, spay, that they use. And to use Eve Tuck and Yang's words, the very limit of justice for them is the state itself. So the question then is, how, can, how do you make claims against uh, the state? So it's not without, uh, uh, you know, so it's as expected, uh, exploitation is wide, widespread across the globe and news articles, reports come aplenty almost every month or so uh, talking about the various uh, exploitation that takes place, long hours, low, play, low pay, uh, unsanitary living conditions, hazardous work conditions, exposure to, chem to chemicals, heat, cold, no access to basic services such as health, legal or legal services or transportation. And there's significant literature, actually, including from Vlad himself, on how these issues are structural uh, to the agroeconomy itself. But what I want to point out is that many of these state-sponsored reports and headlines often suggest that this exploitation is an aberration, it's exceptional. That's the language that you hear. So that in that these liberal states, uh, this is something that functions in the underbelly of the law. You know, that it's not supposed to be there. And this is especially so in countries like Canada and the Netherlands, which pride themselves on substantive equality and labor protections that the state offers. So the focus for reforms that you hear of is often on stricter immigration rules, addressing uh, posting, for example, or closing enforcement gaps, using carceral laws over traffickers, intermediaries, and very rarely or almost never on the agricultural sector itself, uh, except for say, or what could be called as bad apples farm employers, the really bad farm employers. So these exceptional uh, people that is there. And in Netherlands and Canada, especially this, this language of food nationalism, food security, uh, and for such kind of popular discourse uh, uh, hides the corporatized nature of food production. In fact, myths around the human farm worker all serve to obfuscate this agrarian power that, that's there. And scholarship that focus on workers' precarity and systemic ways in which uh, workers' uh, power, be it structural, associational, inst institutional power is denuded, are also left just asking, calling for piecemeal reforms, uh, which of course can, can and will create some much needed improvements, but the system is still left in place. So it is in this um, space that my book makes an intervention by foregrounding histor historicity, coloniality, and resistance within a law and political economy framework. So I'm following on the footsteps of several scholars of migration and coloniality from Nadine Elanani, Tendai Achiume, Lisa Lowe, Radhika Mongia, and most of where most of them, most of these scholarships center the new colonial modalities of immigration law. 
that how hierarchies of power and privilege are managed by law, by immigration law, to create a spatial racial order whereby the majority of racialized people are subject to dispossession, extraction, and exploitation, and obstructed from accessing the privileges of the global north, the global north defined broadly. So in this space, uh, what Elanani proposes is that a counter pedagogy to this law must begin by understanding the connections between historical and ongoing racial projects of capital accumulation and contemporary mig uh, migratory movements. So, um, so temporary foreign worker programs are considered to be a paradigmatic example of a neo-colonial uh, dynamic. So through a broad comparative and historical intervention, what I do is I'll make some broad points. First, I argue that the exploitation is not exceptional or contingent. In fact, legal exceptionalism has had such a long history that it's a misnomer to call it exceptional uh, anymore. Uh, the global agrarian system has been deliberately constructed from the time of colonialism to favor mass commercial agriculture production, and all the frameworks that we see, see in place have been around since the colonial era. I also want to problematize then the claim that it is, it is recent agri-food restructuring in European countries over the last 30 years that are the main factors to uh, producing this highly fungible and exploitable labor force. So, so such kind of recentist explanations you find, you know, such as rural exodus, the prosperity paradox that as regions become richer, there are fewer people to work in these agriculture farms, or, you know, say the European common agricultural policy, the CAP, that advantage larger corporate forms and specialized agriculture. These are all factually right, but it's only partial explanations for a global complex whose foundation had foundations had been put in place much earlier. So the um, so what has happened is that technologies, legal techniques, and institutions of managed labor migration of global commerce that were first experimented in geographically separated out colonies are now in place in the metropole itself. So legal differentiation that was geographically separated out in the colonies, principles where, but where principles of equality and freedom for existed for the metropole, uh, it's no longer so. So what was differentiated through geography and space that you would have unequal laws for people in this colony has now been replaced by differentiation through immigration status within the same geographical area. So, but the unequal une inequality in, 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 in legal rights still uh, persist. And the, the, what happens is that it happens to less obvious mechanisms such as contract interpretation, constructions of consent and coercion, racialized justificatory discourses of deservingness and beneficence, technologies of production and surveillance, and importantly, suppression of resistance and solidarity building uh, through racial uh, substitution. So these can be traced back to colonial histories of control and the use of labor migration across regimes. So it's a call for us to also rethink uh, the sites at which law is created. So as Radhika Mongia describes in her superb book, actually, uh, modes of differential governance over the labor contract was enacted at the colony through justification for exigency. So if you really want to know what, what happened, the history of labor contract, she says, look at what happened in the colonies. Look at what happened to the indentured labor contract. So these exigencies, in fact, were also included resistance by workers in colonial courts, in, in Suriname, in, in, in Trinidad, uh, in Reunion Island, all over where workers challenged breaches of labor contract to create new interpretations of the law. So I show, show how similar processes of Jewish generation, interpretation from below based on practices of refusal by temporary foreign workers in what we in Canada and all these countries similarly create these new areas of law. But as to use this framework from Robert Cover, what happens is also called jurisprudence, where the law is killed uh, by, uh, by courts, by legal institutions, by the legislature uh, to create these forms of exception. So, uh, but whatever it is, the, the most important thing is that, as Radhika Mungia says, is that today all states embody a historically produced colonial dimension with a citizen-migrant distinction as perhaps the primary axis of differentiation. 
urging us to robustly engage with the colonial genealogy, genealogy of the modern state and current labor migration programs. So the uh, so what my book does is actually looks at the global travel of agricultural racial capitalism and legal exceptionalism historically as well as contemporarily. So it starts with historically with the uh, colonial uh, plantation complex and it's a lot of work on this, but Chris Manjapra has actually done a great study on the agrarian uh, complex. So what he's able to show, it's, it's especially uh, informative because what he calls a plantation complex is a set of economic, political, and legal relationships where uh, the control is in Europe or Euro-America for a global commercial network and using transported foreign labor. So it this is similar to using slave labor from Africa to indentured, indentured labor from Asia, all the way to using foreign workers globally now. So as he argues, capitalism flowed from relations and methods that, that were perfected at the periphery. So it's, it's not that, uh, so we have to look at the periphery to see what these modalities and techniques of, of capitalism and where the law uh, and where, how law works. So, um, so the propagation of agriculture capitalism around the world, as he calls it, occurred through very district, uh, discrete steps. And it actually began with the commercial cultivation of sugar and monocropping and cash, or what, what we call as cash cropping, which is basically the production of cash crops, not uh, uh, agriculture, or not crops for daily sustenance, which we see, and it's especially important for Netherlands, Netherlands being one of the primary exporters of, of, of cash crops. Uh, most of the production here is for cash crops where the migrant workers work and you know floriculture for example the tulips there's a whole space we are talking about about workers working in agriculture towards cash cropping so this uh cash cropping you know at that point in the 1800s uh, with, with, uh, with the industrial revolution it started with this high demand for export goods tea and sugar for industrial workers jute for packaging tea and chocolate for the middle class so cash crops to this day are labor intensive and are mainly for profit. And he shows how, how New Orleans cotton seeds were sent to India, Trinidadian chocolate seeds were sent to Africa and Brazilian rubber plants to Malaya. And if you follow the story of flowers, you know, again, coming back to the Netherlands context, it's all over Ecuadorian uh, tulips coming from Kenya, which is then comes here, which is then shipped to the rest of the world from from Rotterdam. So these processes that he talks about, it's like this huge exchange, a traveling complex that he talks about in this space. And at the same time, uh, there was also these, these practices that were uh, that were transmitted. So for example, Mississippi plantation overseers were recruited by the East India Company to institute slave-like labor control on Indian plantations in Assam and around Bombay. Cuban horticultural manuals were being studied by sugar entrepreneurs in the Dutch East Indies. Uh, in short, this globalization of the techniques of racial agrarianism was transferred, replicated, and locally transformed in this colonial geography. So when I was landing here yesterday, I could see the greenhouses. Uh, you know, I, it's been about a, a few decades since I've come, a couple of uh, ten, about ten years since I've come. But the greenhouses explosion when you're landing is something to note. But the interesting thing is, Windsor, where I come from, is the same. Apparently, the greenhouses in the Windsor Essex area are using. Dutch technologies, including vertical uh, vertical farming in these greenhouses, and you can now see them from the moon. So I don't know how true that is, you know, but but that is the kind of technology transfer of technologies uh, that we hear of. So what else was happening? So um, uh, during what he calls the Bonanza years, uh, was were also were also the uh, the use of race neutral laws, which facilitated labor migrations. You know, so we had. Uh, this whole hegemonic discourse of free trade, but you had the passing of the Sugar Duties Act, repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846, and new land regulations all over that befitted European planters, as well as native landlords and big peasants who agreed to plant such crops. So in fact, what he's able to show is that the farming, local farming boom at the metropole in Europe, in Canada, of, of small farmers were on the backs 
of this large corporatization of uh, agriculture that was happening in, 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 in the colonies of the same uh, countries. So where does it, so, and in other places like uh, in, uh, there was also a large displacement. So for example, he uh, talks about, you know, we saw, we heard, saw the fires that took place in Hawaii a few weeks back. So, uh, and you heard about how this happened as a result of the great Mahele or the great division of lands where 60% of the lands in the Hawaiian archipelago was forcibly acquired by the crown and subsequently claimed by American uh, agricultural business interests. This was in 1848. And all of this managed migration played a big role because all of these plantation ventures involved the importation of bonded migrant laborers from neighboring regions or from across the sea. So for example, Chinese indentured laborers were the first to work on the tea fields in Assam in India. But these Indian indentured laborers from the same area were being sent to the Caribbean for their sugar plantations there. And the tribal communities from the hill tracks of those areas were also locally displaced to work in these farms. And it was happening in Africa as well, where people from Northwest Cameroon were brought down from the hills to work in the tea and coffee plantations on the coast. Uh, Tamil workers, often from uh, uh, caste op uh, oppressed communities, were brought in large numbers to Sri Lanka. Um, and um, so this uh, this indenture system coordinated many distinct migrations, Indian workers to Fiji and Mauritius, Chinese laborers to Peru and Queensland, Australia, and, and a lot of inter, inter, inter migrations of subaltern peoples and ethnic groups. So what we have then is that uh, this plantation complex oriented the heavily indebted smallhold rice farmers of Burma and Bengal, the tea pluckers in Assam, the Chinese indentured servants in Fiji, and the Afro-Caribbean laborers in Guyana to what Du Bois called a common destiny, which was a quote that I had in an earlier slide, the common destiny of the workers uh, that are happening over here. So what, what's our interest would be the juridical uh, labor contract. Okay, so the 19th century transformation also saw uh, an obsessive concern with consent, consent and will. So the post, uh, you know, the abolition of slavery and post Haitian revolution, uh, the, the general discourse was that free labor is actually going to be far more productive than the slave labor that was actually there. So a lot of interest was in create, was an obsessive consent with this idea of consent or will, uh, which was uh, put in place. So in the British colonies, for example, a protector was instituted whose job was to examine one by one without the presence of any of the parties interested in the system, every laborer professing a desire to embark. So he would make sure that the labor fully understands what he undertakes in his understanding, and then they'll make out uh, a certificate. So at that point, the terms of the contracts, the indentured contracts were so appalling that several, several people at that time in, in colonial powers argued that they could simply not have consented to these terms. But in response to this criticism, committees Many committees were instituted, both by the Dutch East India Company and by the East India Company to create the survey of a bunch of a list of questions, which regarded, did you get enough food? Are you being paid wages? Are you satisfied with the performance of the engagement on the part of the employer? Do you clearly understand your conditions? Uh, are, are you working on Sunday or a free consent? Uh, when you're required to perform extra work, did they do it out of their own free will? And so on. And as Mongia say, shows that a lot of these questions are complex metaphysical questions. And for any of us who work, who have worked in, who have worked with workers, we know these questions are not just survey questions, but they end up being survey questions. And the workers have to answer yes or no. And for the most part, they say yes, just like the workers who come to my migrant farm worker clinic. Not that different because they do respond to surveys by the Ministry of Labor in their blitzes. And you know, have you been treated well? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, so you just go through this survey system that is there to show uh, that there is a consent uh, that happens. So um, what we have uh, then is basically what she shows is that 
there are a number of dimensions of this migration control system, which got instituted there, which includes, in fact, uh, uh, labor blitzes, uh, labor surveys, surveys by the Ministry of Labor, ministries of labor on whether the workers are actually consenting to the, uh, to the systems that was there uh, in place. So, so what, uh, what was important though, is that the paternalism of the state to make sure that they are not uh, exploiting, uh, it required the workers to consent, to freely consent to the terms. But as we see today, there was no question of the structure of, of consenting itself. So one of the big things that happened with the labor contract, with the contract law in general in, in the 1800s, was that by moving from status to contract, the idea was that we are not going to be paternalistic and question whether both parties have equal agency to enter into the contract. It's going to be taken uh, for granted that uh, so long as they have uh, signed onto the contract, they have built the contract, and now this contract binds to them. So the issue of freedom had was already disappearing from the contract. And we see that issue of, 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 uh, of uh, although it has, it has been mitigated in both Dutch law, con on civil law and common law through various forms of reasonableness and good faith and so on, but this idea was always there. We're not looking at the structural differences between the two parties so long, because that would be paternalistic, and so long as they've consented, we have a contract in place. So what that happened then is that uh, uh, is that uh, you have a system where not only is a laborer free to sell her labor, she's compelled to do so, right? But the idea that how the system itself is compelling these workers to sell their labor form is, is very much in the background because we have to feed this giant agrarian complex that's happening over there. And we have to make sure that it's done using our liberal laws that are taking place. So it enters into these paradoxes which 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 show you know these aporias within the system itself, like the places where it just doesn't make sense. You're binding, you have to consent to this, you have to go through all of this, but you're making no sense of what's out there. So the um uh so the uh so the, this free labor contract, in fact, most historical scholars say is that it is the most obvious, the most of first and most obvious way of dominating indentured workers was actually through this labor contract. Uh, and there were other subtle means of control included uh, on, the, on the workers, such as the use of a pass system. So uh, you had to have a legal pass to leave the plantation, preventing workers from leaving the plantation. Um, and, uh, you know, Rose Marion Hoftes' uh, work on indentured laborers in the Dutch East Indies in Suriname is, is one of excellent work uh, on this issue. Um, and the third, uh, which is of which is of importance is through uh, worker replacement. In Suriname, for example, because of massive protests in India and globally, uh, the indentured em emigration from India was halted in 1917. However, by the time the planters had already tapped onto a new source of labor, the Dutch East Indies. So from 1890 to 1940, a total of 33,000 Dutch Javanese came to Suriname to work to replace uh, to replace what uh, the end of the in Indian indentured uh, system. In British Guyana, Walter Rodney similarly describes how plantations always preferred new immigrant new immigrant workers because the idea was the newer workers were deemed to be more compliant, more docile, less likely to protest as opposed to workers who have been working there for a long time. You know, going back to the temporal aspects. Uh, of, of this labor. And um, as he points out, the mi white minority would increase the division among the workers by encouraging labor competition, emphasizing racial and religious differences, and employing tactics such as preferential treatment of particular groups of workers, co-optation, and racial stereotyping. And these are familiar tactics that I see every day at the farms, that uh, Jamaican workers, uh, in Canada are usually given work such as plucking apples because they're taller, they're, uh, they're deemed to uh, be better at plucking apples. Uh, Mexican workers are given stoop labor, 
plucking berries from the floor. Women, uh, because they apparently have soft hands, are, are much better at picking grapes or ice wine or strawberries and, you know, uh, I don't know, girly things like that, I suppose. So these kinds of stereotypes are used to create a racial segmentation in within even the same sector that there is. And uh, even the, the production of replacement worked the same way. The first group of workers um, in the Canadian program were Jamaican workers. When the Jamaican workers began to protest um, and cause strikes, they were replaced by Mexican workers who they thought, well, they're Spanish speakers, they would not know the language. And so large, the largest group of workers now are from Mexico. But soon the Mexican workers began to mobilize and they were replaced by Guatemalan workers, a lot of them who are indigenous themselves and for whom Spanish is a second language. And right now there's a two year ag stream with which we are workers from Indonesia, Thai and other communities which have a lesser history of, of mobilization. So this kind of uh, worker uh, replacement uh, was something that was perfected even at that time. And Suriname is a great example for that. So uh, another issue was also language difficulties at the local courts, which applied European law. Um, decisions, and some of the decisions were actually quite good, often milder penalties for breaking the contract from the worker side than what the planters wanted, were upheld in Netherlands courts, which are, which are far away uh, from these colonies. The important thing that I want to talk about before concluding this section is this idea, is that are the workers actually docile? So this is the part of my book that I hope to challenge with every section that there is, that there. So the way uh, that we notice for in in our uh, for these migrant workers is that you don't see large scale strikes or large scale unionization. But what you see uh, as resistance is actually refusals, practices of refusals. Uh, in black studies tradition, this is called fugitivity, uh, traditions of fugitivity. But what you see is uh, is refusal. So for example, if you see what in the, the, uh, the uh, decisions in the Marienburg court in Suriname, in 1898, a total of 742 persons were convicted, and just one year, and 47% of that was unwillingness to work. So, um, and you also see that, um, you also see that, uh, uh, 227 British Indians fled the plantations during a period during which new, there were numerous wage disputes and strikes. There were, in fact, there were 15 major rebellions over a 30-year period in one plant in one plantation area in Surina. Um, in um, and you see a differentiation being made that we see everywhere between the types of workers, between Javanese workers and the East Indian workers. So, for example. 15% uh, of the complaints against Javanese men used to get withdrawn by itself, by the planters, whereas 32% against East Indian women used to be consistently withdrawn. In terms of people who are convicted under labor laws, uh, Indians were convicted lesser because of the way the British, uh, 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 because of the power of the British East India Company at that time, uh, whereas higher number of Javanese contract laborers were of Dutch nationality uh, used to be uh, convicted. And solidarity between the communities was actively interpreted, you, even giving religious rights. Muslims would be given a rights to have, Muslim workers were given the rights to pray, but not uh, workers from other religions and so on and so forth. But there are many examples where fights between worker communities ended up as mass protests against the plantation and the authorities when they tried to apply uh, their uh, means and control. In fact, the same dissertation, you can see this really great story about these 1900, uh, 1902, riots in 1902 in Suri Suriname by this large alliance of British Indians uh, and Dutch Javanese to protect against wage reduction. And this was such a large case that it was reported all over, all over the Netherlands, uh, this case was reported. And, and for one of the few times, um, uh, there was, uh, they brought in interpreters in five languages, Hindi, Hindi, French, Surinamese, Chinese, and Javanese for 19 witnesses to talk about, to process these cases. 
So what, I would, what I'm pointing out in, in my work is that these high number of cases involving breach of, and there were also high number of cases with which the workers brought forth involving breach of contract before the courts of evidence, there are, is evidence of uh, persistent protest. Now, I'm not bringing the courts, you know, the colonial courts as any form of, uh, you know, uh, 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 any form of, of respite because you know, the courts served simultaneously as instruments to maintain plunder control, but also it did protect the intentions against excessive exploitation. This language that we hear a lot with the anti-trafficking and anti-slavery prov provisions that are being used and to promote civilized and uh, Western uh, behavior. So these, uh, so, but what is, what I would like to move on to is that uh, there, this, there was this unresolvable, un, the demise of the system was because of these unresolvable paradoxes that I've been talking about and this large scale resistance that led to it. So how can we think about that in, in, the, in the lessons for the uh, temporary foreign worker system? But the thing is, indentured contracts were time limited. There was a light at the end of the tunnel for the indentured contract laborers, uh, at the end of which the workers could stay back. The workers could stay back, they could become free workers, and the free workers could work with the indentured workers, and they could mobilize the workers for these legal claims, tell them about what to do, and so on and so forth. So the uh, TFW program, the, the foreign worker programs now, have perfected the suppression of resistance by removing this right to remain. And that is actually a very critical aspect when we think about power and resistance and solidarity building, which is why you will find uh, far less unionization, the lack of interest among trade unions to mobilize these workers uh, and so on and so forth. But the thing is, uh, scholars such as Kamala Kempadu and so on ask us to think about when we're using languages like human trafficking and modern slavery, what is actually happening? Now, because sure, a lot of the conditions are the same. You know, the uh, a lot of the workers come through debt. Uh, they make can make claims to a range of human rights and so on and so forth. But this idea of human trafficking and modern slavery is again a very individualized way of thinking about what is happening in the system. What it does is again, as I said, catches the bad apples, catches the worst excesses, but maintains the system very much like the way the colonial courts were trying to do. In that you we are going to have a court of justice for you all because oh, the excesses don't happen, but let the system continue for the agrarian complex. So the uh, um, these are some of the works that I use. So from the colonies, then what I talk about is that the interesting what what happened and what are simultaneously what simultaneously happening at settler col settler col colonies such as Canada, Australia, and the United States was that, uh, as I said before, was that, was that it was also uh, a, a process in which family farms were being created uh, in these spaces. So at this point, what I go do in my book, and I won't have much time to get into it today, is that uh, is how the periphery is now moved into the metropole. Uh, so all these issues that we are talking about is the, is the slow progress of, of many of these issues that takes place at the metropole. Canada is an easy example when we think about settler colonialism because it was constructed as an extension of Britain where settlers formed a nation state by displacing and disenfranchising indigenous people in these territories. But the settler nation state is a contradiction in and of itself. It's because the ideal citizens were supposed to be constituted through land cultivation in the, the farmers, uh, the Canadian farmers. But it would not be possible without relying on unfree labor from those who they perceived as savage, savages and undesirable foreigners. And unlike the colonies, now you need these undesirables within your borders. They're not going to be far away. They're not going to be in Suriname. They're not going to be in Guyana. They're going to be within the borders of your uh, country. And this is something that Canada faced early on, is that it's great to talk about farming, doing, uh, you know, building Canada through agricultural, you know, the, the Lockean ideal of agriculture, but where is the labor going to come from? 
in Canada, you did not have, uh, you know, as much plantation slavery was not as big as in the United States. And Canada necessitates at that time, that the weather of Canada necessitates a seasonal workforce. Uh, you only need workers for a specific amount of time. And in fact, slave labor is very, was very expensive for agriculture workers, for, for the agriculture sector in Canada, because what you do with slave labor when you do not need the labor anymore during winters, right? So, so in that sense that uh, this need for seasonal labor uh, was important, but even indentured labor doesn't capture it, right? Because now the indentured labor can remain there for that time. But they did try for a long time to uh, to get indentured labor, but unlike in other, unlike in the colonies, uh, because of the uh, construction of Canada as white Canada, what they wanted were poorer British citizens. So a lot of Scottish and Irish uh, workers came through the indentured system to work in Canada uh, with the promise that, well, you work for two years and you can settle here, you can buy your own land, um, but you know, just still our lands. Uh, it didn't. It wasn't that successful either, because a lot of these workers would just run away. They would just go. You know, their their uh, the, uh, the color of the skin permitted them to move into other areas, permitted them to run away to the United States, and uh, engage in other kind of work. So uh, what you what they did was so it was this very reluctant. Uh, reluctant way in which Chinese labor, uh, Indian labor. Uh, which at that time ha were had the right to free immigration into Canada because Canada was part of British territory, so everybody should go. We should be allowed to move within the territories of Canada. But the only immigration that Canada wanted was white immigration, while other uh, groups were excluded out. So even though they were wanted for their labor, uh, there were these uh, neutral ways in which they were obstructed from entering. So for example, the Chinese head tax is something. They had to pay a higher tax to enter the country. There was a legislation called the Continuous Journey Legislation, where the only people permitted into Canada had to be people who could enter Canada with a continuous journey. So. Who, so that left only Europeans because they could just take one ship to, uh, to cross the Atlantic and to come to Canada, but not other places. So there was this great process because of, 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 of ways in which of trying to get people to work, but at the same time not have them be citizens. That was a challenge for, uh, for settler colonial countries that we see. So this is a Privy Council order and agriculturists were, were priorities for uh, for people to come into Canada, but it was still very much a white Canada that, that was meant to be constructed at that time. The thing is, move fast forward today, and you'll see that, uh, that agricultural, the blue line is the agricultural uh, labor. And it's it's agricultural labor uh, is one of the largest groups of temporary work, temporary uh, migrants into into the country, and that has just been increasing since the time of Confederation. That there is the rest are mainly permanent immigrants coming through skilled worker. So going back to Walzer said is that for agriculture we cannot have permanent immigrants because why would they work in agriculture why would they work under these conditions so agriculture becomes has been singled out as one of the areas in which we still want to have this exceptional process called the temporary foreign worker program even though canada is known as a country that welcomes immigrants and all other uh, forms of migration shows uh, that process so what we have uh, how much time do we have Five. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, so before, uh, so just quickly uh, coming back to the story of the contract, is that this is how the seasonal agriculture uh, work uh, permit contract looks like. And you can see that the worker has to sign to various things, uh, the employer agrees to various parts. And one of the issues, again, in a trade form of control from the contract is that uh, the employer is supposed to pay for the flight uh, to and fro from the country, which seems like a great idea, right? Like, you know, Caribbean workers can go in. But that aspect is actually used as a way to, uh, as a way to control uh, work, to control workers. So for example, in a worker is terminated, uh, the within 24 hours, usually, the worker is repatriated back to the country using chartered flights. 
flights that you know you and I cannot use using charter flights to go back because they said, look, our contract says that we have to pay for you. We cannot have you here. This is the only flight that you have to take. Please go back. You have to go back right away. So in fact, a lot of the work that my organization does, who's teacher for migrant workers, is actually go to the airports and catch the workers and tell them, well, you don't have to get onto the flight to have them come out so that their so that their cases can be filed at the labor courts and so on. But again, you see how contractual agreements play uh, uh, play this very funny role as a technique of control, as a technique of control uh, that there is. So, uh, so in general, again, from my from our experience is that our workers are acutely aware of these treatment and conditions. And in fact, the idea that the idea of consent is something that is continuously challenged in the work that we do. Uh, they understand what happens, how racial differentiation is, is performed in the farms, and how there is this praxis of refusal that happens. So what I look at, in fact, uh, the, my paper on this is coming out in a few weeks, is a similar form of legal mobilization through a practice of refusal that happens amongst these workers. So what I show is that these supporting workers who seek to escape uh, the uh, escape the employer, actually, to escape the employer uh, is a lot of the work that we do is these triaging cases. So if, if, if in fact, one of the, the first cases in the Human Rights Tribunal, uh, Adrian Montrose's case um, was when this worker, he was called uh, racial slurs. And then when he protested, he was immediately sent back to St. Lucia, but he managed to come back to Canada through other means. And then he uh, got in touch with Hustisha and Hustisha filed this case for him at the Human Rights Tribunal, which became the first human rights discrimination case uh, for a migrant worker. And a lot of these are triaging cases. So we're not looking at fancy constitutional ch challenges, large scale, um, you know, large scale uh, social movement kind of ideas or unions going in, union negotiation and so on. But a lot of people have usually criticized this. And that is the part that I'm also challenging in my book, is a lot of people have criticized, well, there is this docility among these workers. They don't want to engage with the law. They want to just do what they come, you know, come here for 24 months, go back. That's the part that they need. But in their everyday practices of refusal, in their everyday uh, practices of refusal, you can actually see uh, uh, forms of resistance. And the question that we want to think about law or jurist generation or law being created at these sites is how can we uh, transform these practices of refusal into regenerative law, law at these spaces. And these are some of the examples that I gave with Adrian Montrose's case, uh, with those cases in Suriname uh, and how that works. So I theorize this more in this paper, which I urge you to read if you want to read or don't read, I don't care. But uh, uh, but um, uh, the third section, the last section, which I, which actually may be of greater interest is actually from the settled colony to the metropole. So that's the third stage where we're talking, where, where I, I'll be researching and talking about what happens in European context, where in a, in a, for something like Netherlands, it's quite interesting because you they do have, uh, uh, corporate farms that have their farms in the global south, in Ecuador, in Colombia. At the same time, you have the workers in these farms. At the same time, you have this high glorification of the agriculture sector, agriculture nationalism, and so on. So what is happening is the third part, so at, at the uh, metropole. So with that, I uh, conclude uh, my speedy talk. <laughs>